Hey everybody, uh, welcome, in a, welcome to another episode of the MAE Speaker Series, Industry Insights from Data Grads. So today we're actually going to be joined by MAE alumni, Daniel Mayer from GE Appliances. So Daniel actually graduated from the University of Florida in spring 10, 2017 with a Bachelor's in Mechanical Engineering. And uh, when he was a, at UF, he was actually a member of ASME, Solar Gators Design Team, and was, he was also a TA for two first-year engineering courses. And following graduation, he actually went to Louisville, uh, Kentucky uh, to go work for GE Appliances as a member of their supply chain development program. And he spent two years actually working in supply chain in, in areas such as supplier quality, lean, material planning, sourcing, procurement. Right now, Daniel's actually a commodity buyer at the strategic sourcing team. And then on top of doing all of that, uh, for his normal job duties, he's also a head recruiter for G Appliances and regularly hires a mechanical aerospace students for co-ops and full-time positions at the Career Showcase uh, every fall and spring. So with all that being said, uh, Daniel, uh, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Noel. Um, first off, I wanted to thank all of you guys here for, um, for joining, taking the time out of your day. I know it's lunchtime for everybody, so really appreciate you guys uh, watching. And, and hopefully we can we can share my experience a little bit and uh, hopefully you can learn a little bit um, about this topic of using your engineering degree indirectly. Um, so just first off a little bit about myself. Um, I wanted to tell you that you know I, I graduated from UF uh, very recently in the class of 2017. I was a mechanical engineering grad with my bachelor's. I'm currently getting my uh, MBA through the University of Louisville um, here where I live and that's all through GE Appliances as well. Um, I'll be graduating, I believe, next spring uh, with my MBA. And then here I have just real quick, if you want to write down my, my email, take a picture of it. Um, I know the video will be up, up later on YouTube. So feel free to contact me about anything, any questions you have about GE, about you know UF life, about almost anything. Um, I'm pretty much an open book and I'm relatively quick to respond to email. You know, if, if it's not the same day, it, it could be within a couple of days, but um, I'm here to help in anything you guys might need. So a um, little bit of experience that uh, I have, you know, I'm, I'm from Florida, born and raised, was born in St. Pete, um, actually grew up in Tallahassee, so uh, kind of a traitor to come down uh, down to Gainesville, but uh, it was definitely worth it, um, definitely the way better school, in my opinion, for engineering, um, definitely, so um, really, really enjoyed my time down at UF from 2012 to 2017. Um, as Noel said, I was a, a member of ASME. I was also um, pretty involved in the Solar Gators design team uh, when that was just starting up. So that was a lot of fun to be, to be a member of um, and be a part of those teams. And then I was also involved in a lot of vo volunteer organizations. So I spent a lot of time with Dance Marathon and uh, with Streetlight, which is a volunteer organization down at Shands. Um, on top of that, I uh, really wanted to make sure that I was involved with my fraternity. So I did philanthropy chair and I was involved with all the sports we were playing. Um, and I think part of this presentation is going to go into how, you know, you, you don't have to get all of your experience in engineering. So for me, from my experience, I, I did solar gators and then a little bit of ASME involvement, which a lot of you guys are probably, you know, very in tune with and know what's going on with those organizations. But if there's other organizations that you're really curious about joining and are worried that it's not going to tie into your engineering degree or it's not going to benefit you, um, I want to kind of help you understand that that's not the case. Um, what I would say, though, is if you're not getting involved in engineering organizations and want to be involved in something else, whether it's Dance Marathon or um, some other student run organizations, just make sure you're trying to hold a leadership position. That's what I think is the most important. Um, so make sure you know, you're not just a general body member, a general member of all of these organizations. You can be involved in 15, but if you're just a member, um, it's not going to go as far as if you held some sort of position. Now, it doesn't have to be president, it doesn't have to be vice president, but if you're a, you know, a secretary or a treasurer or a team leader of one of these different groups, that goes a lot longer, a lot more, um, shows a lot more experience than just being involved in a bunch of different things. So outside of, uh, outside of school, when I, when I went to GE Appliances, I have mainly all my experiences come from supply chain. So I joined the supply chain development program. I spent two years in that program learning sourcing, supplier quality, lean, and material planning. So a lot of these might be uh, things that a lot of mechanical engineers don't know a whole lot about. Um, I, I do very little quote unquote mechanical engineering. Um, so right now I'm a sourcing uh, commodity buyer. So I am in charge of bringing material from suppliers into the plant and dealing with negotiating prices and uh, contract negotiations and trying to consolidate, you know, maybe right now I have a desk of about 50 suppliers that I'm in charge of. And my goal right now is to bring that number down closer to 25. So 
doing that, I can save the company business, save the company money and really work towards our strategic goal of mitigating the, or minimizing the number of suppliers that we have. Um, outside of work, I enjoy golf, disc golf. I've been playing a lot of pickleball, which is kind of like an older people version of tennis uh, with some of my neighbors. Um, my wife and I have an eight month old golden retriever. So we're pretty much outdoors as, as much as possible going on hikes and, and kayaking and whatnot. So anything I can do to get outside is, is really what I'm trying to do. So for this session, you know, I'm obviously going to talk about this using your engineering degree indirectly uh, topic, but then we'll go into a bit about GE appliances. We'll talk through our inclusion and diversity. We'll go through our COVID-19 response, which is obviously pretty important right now. Um, then we'll go into what I think a lot of you want to know more about is, is recruiting. So I'm actually one of the head recruiters for UF. Um, I recruit for the supply chain team and I, I've come down ever since I started at GE appliances. I've come down for just about every single showcase to recruit and uh, bring high quality UF candidates um, up for our co-op positions. And then I'll highlight some future events we got going on. We only have one set date, but since we believe that we'll probably be doing recruiting virtually this year, um, we have some dates of things we wanna, we wanna showcase, whether they're info sessions or different meet and greets that hopefully you guys can be involved in. So I'll go over some of those. And then I think Noel will uh, field some questions and I'll be happy to answer anything that I can. So for myself, again, like I said, I, I'm in the supply chain field, so it's not directly tied to engineering. Um, and I'll kind of break it up into how GE breaks up engineering. So we, we hire engineers for either supply chain or technology. And we define technology as kind of your design engineers. That's where a lot of your um, CAD work is being done. A lot of your design work is being done. So for any of the parts that we design ourselves and we manufacture ourselves, um, or even parts that we buy from suppliers, we're usually designing them to fit the kind of model or the, the appliance that we're trying to build. And um, that that is being done by our technology team. So that's where you're going to use your direct you know, engineering experience, your, your MECI experience, your aerospace engineering experience, and your classes that you're taking now, whether it's DML or mom lab or thermo you know, fluids or heat transfer, all of that goes more into the technology side of things. Myself, I'm in supply chain. So that's revolving around getting parts from suppliers, bringing them to the plant. Um, once they're in the plant, how are we going to then assemble them? How are the operators going to put them together in the proper order to where we're staying safe and doing it the most efficient way possible? And once we've built the appliance, how are we then bringing it out to our warehouses properly? And how are we then getting it out to the consumer in a timely manner? So all of that is part of the supply chain, which is more about what I'll be talking about today. And so for that, you may not think like, why do you need an engineering degree? Why aren't you just going into business? Why aren't you, you know, doing something that may be more related to supply chain? Um, but at GE Appliances, we hire almost specifically engineering grads for our supply chain teams. And that's because we're good at the three things highlighted below, which is we have good people skills, we're good at problem solving, and we are very good critical thinkers. And those are three things that you are learning every single day right now at the University of Florida, um, whether it's in your classes or in these different groups that you're being involved in. Um, those are three skills that I think you should make sure that you're honing and you're building upon and adding to your resume so that when you go and talk to different companies, whether, whether you go talk to me at Career Showcase, um, I want to see that you're highlighting those skills, even if you don't have any industry experience, because that's what's going to make you go far, especially in the supply chain field, but honestly, in any field you go into. If you can highlight your people skills, problem solving abilities and, and critical thinking skills, you're, you're going to go places. So we'll get started with people skills. Now, specifically for GE Appliances, um, all of our plants are, are union plants, uh, especially the ones in Louisville, Kentucky, where we're headquartered. So if you go in there as a co-op or an intern or even a salaried employee, um, you won't be a part of the union. So there's a, a relationship that you have to manage there that you have to understand. There's different kind of obligations that each group is, is tied to. And there's contracts that, that get negotiated to where um, union employees have certain rights and salaried employees have to have to uh, work around those. So it's really important that you, when you go into an environment like that, where, you know, it doesn't have to be union versus salary, but when you go into an environment where you are not, you know, in the same kind of group or in the same level as another person, you have to understand how to still get what you need to get done um, in a respectful manner and, and have both parties understand what needs to be done. So, you know, from a union relationship, if I go out on the floor, on the plant floor, and I'm trying to solve an issue or bring it down about bring about an engineering design change i have to understand that i need to know who the union steward is on the line i need to know what the union regulations are on that part of the line and if i'm allowed to touch certain parts or if i'm allowed to help out you know installing a certain part of the unit um, most of the times i'm not as a salaried employee but if i have taken the time to get to know the union steward get to know you know the different people on the line and make relationships and build these relationships 
um, then I've found that you can get a lot more done and get it done a lot quickly, a lot more quickly and uh, a lot more efficiently than if you just went in kind of as this, oh, I have a college degree or I'm in college right now. Some of you maybe don't. Then if you go in with that attitude, you're not going to get a lot done. You're going to get a lot of pushback. So really, it's just important to know how to have this emotional intelligence of how to deal with people, how to build relationships. And then I think more importantly than building them is maintaining the relationships. So if I go out and, you know, it's the first time meeting somebody, I might take five or 10 minutes to, you know, get to know them before I even ask the question I'm going to ask to let them know, hey, I'm here to understand you and your job. Um, I'm not just here to tell you what to do. So that's really important. If, if you maintain a relationship, you're going to be able to come back to that person and ask a question or get help from them in the future and not have to restart this whole relationship building process again. Um, and all of this comes from, you know, your leadership experience, you're building these communication skills in all your classes, uh, and the different groups you're a part of, the different teams, you know, if you're in mom lab or if you're in DML, you're working in a team, you're building your communication skills, um, you're going to have conflicts. All of that will build into, you know, being a manager and being in charge of certain people that may have more experience than you. And that's kind of a big deal as well. You know, if you go out on the manufacturing floor, there's going to be operators that have probably been working on that line maybe longer than some of you have been alive. I know definitely longer than I've, you know, been here. So you have to go in, you know, without a chip on your shoulder and, and understand that, they probably know more about the line than you do, even though they may not have a high school degree, you know, so you have to understand there's still things you can learn from somebody that's taken a different path of life than you. Um, and having the knowledge and the, the emotional intelligence to be able to go through that and, and work with people that are on different levels that come from different walks of life is, is really important. And you can use that anywhere you go. So make sure that when you're in your classes, or you're in your different groups, you're, you're understanding different walks of life, different cultures, and how to interact with different people to make sure that you can get the things you want done in a respectful manner. So next we'll talk about problem solving. And this is something that's pretty self-explanatory, pretty easy to understand that you're going through in all of your classes, you know, there at UF, you're working at on multiple classes, multiple projects at once. They're all have the same deadlines. You're all trying to finish it before exam week or before midterms or whatnot. Um, and you have to learn to prioritize and prioritization is, is probably one of the biggest things that you're gonna learn um, to use in, in your real world work experience and your, once you graduate and you go into the, you know, into the manufacturing environment, um, prioritization is, is key. You're going to be in charge of multiple large scale projects. And then you're also going to have these day-to-day -day things that you got to get done as a part of your regular job and being able to manage those and juggle all of those is really important. So make sure you're, you're staying organized and you're learning that in your classes right now, you know, if you're struggling to maintain three classes, um, try and figure out how you can do that better and understand different tactics and techniques uh, to prioritize what projects you need to work on first, what's more urgent, what's more important. And when you get kind of this rhythm of, of how you're prioritizing and organizing your information, it makes it a lot easier when you go into the real world and start working in, in your engineering teams uh, to be able to solve th solve all of these problems at once and not get bogged down by one if you're, you're struggling with it um, while still realizing you have you know, five more projects to complete. Um, so, so make sure you're, you're working on your problem solving, but also your, your time management skills and your, your prioritization, prioritization skills. And alongside that, you know, everything that you're working on is going to require design thinking, experimental thinking. There's no one answer to something. Um, so make sure you, you go through and understand the trial and error process, right? When you come in as a co-op, you're, you're not going to have any experience working in a manufacturing floor for your first time. And you're going to probably make the wrong decision one or two times. And that's okay as long as you learn from it and don't make the mistake again. So make sure that you're taking from these classes, this kind of design and experimental thinking um, into the workplace, which is primarily the reason that we hire mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers into supply chain, because they have this kind of brain, this kind of mindset. So lastly, uh, we'll talk about critical thinking. And now this is a little bit less self-explanatory. It's not entirely tied to classes. So in a lot of your classes, you know, maybe say thermo or calculus or, or differential equations, you may, there may, there's always a set answer, right? So there's, there's an equation that you have to solve. There's maybe a couple ways to solve the problem, but the answer is already there. Um, in the workplace, there's the problems that you're going to be running into are brand new. No one's seen them before because if they've been seen before, if they've been solved, they're not going to happen. It's not going to be an issue, right? So um, you're going to be running into brand new issues that no one's seen before and you have to come up with some creative new way to solve this problem. And it's most likely not going to be a solution you've applied anywhere before. So just understand that where you're going to get that experience from is outside of classes. 
So that's going to be whether you're dealing with, you know, people, if you're managing a team, whether that's an intramurals or if you're managing an ASMU design team, or uh, if you're a part of uh, SHEP, or if you're a part of the uh, Solar Gators design team, or if you're a part of the, um, uh, what is it, the uh, autonomous gator uh, robotic vehicle, I think that you guys still have. Any of these teams, you might run into conflicts, and that's where you're going to learn some critical thinking. So if you run into a, a people that you're butting heads with, you have to design some sort of, you know, way to compromise and, and figure out how to get to the best solution that either works for both parties or has one party understand that the other solution is the better way to go. Um, that's, that's a really, uh, that's a, a lot of experience you can gain from that goes into thinking critically and thinking outside of the box because people solution, people problems are the hardest problems you're going to face. You know, engineering issues, there's, a lot of math and a lot of equations going into there, it's a lot easier to solve. Um, and a lot of our brains are wired to think that way. So those kind of come easier. But when you're trying to solve problems between people, you have to think a lot more critically. You have to think a lot more outside the box um, to come up with these new solutions. And that kind of thinking and that style of thinking will transfer directly into the workplace, even when it's on non-people related problems and engineering problems. So just understand that that's a really great skill to have if you can think outside the box and color outside the lines to solve problems, you're going to come up with ideas that other people haven't thought of before. And that's going to make you go a lot farther and solve problems a lot quicker than, than others in the workplace. Um, and just one more thing to touch on, this is kind of more relating to, to co-op positions and, and positions that you would have at GE Appliances is they're real world projects. So anything that you're thinking of, any critical thinking problems that you're going to have to deal with, they're impacting the line 100%. So, um, and those have real world dollar implications as well. I'll give kind of an example of myself. I, I co-opted for GE in 2015, um, missed the fall football season. So I had to, had to deal with watching every football game on TV and didn't end up going to the swamp at all, which was rough, but definitely worth it. Um, I was working in supplier quality. I had, uh, I was working on a, a supplier issue with these um, cams that went into the washing machines. So it's, they were called mode shifters. It shifted the cycle from rinse to spin cycle to agitate, um, you name it. And we were having an issue where the cam was not rotating fully to actually switch the cycle. And so I was testing about a thousand of these parts a day, trying to find the right date codes that had good parts and the date codes that had defective parts so I could get the supplier some feedback. Um, what I didn't realize is the cam had to be put back into kind of its start position, its reset position before being installed to the unit. So I was unaware of this. I would test the, the, the part, leave the cam where it was, write my initials on it, put it back in the box, send it to the line. I didn't know that that was an issue until the next morning. I get to work at 7.30, you know, the line starts at six in the morning. So I have about 30 emails asking me what's going on with these parts. We've sent 30 units to repair already. You know, it's, we're having a whole lot of downtime because of this issue. And we had to realize, was this a supplier issue? Was this an in-house issue? What was the deal? So obviously I went through and looked at all the parts that were defective and realized they all had my initial on them. So kind of freaked out, had to go pull every part that had my initial off the line, um, go and reset them to the right position, get good parts to the line so they could keep running um, and then go explain to my superiors and the plant manager kind of what happened. So that might sound like it was a crazy story and it, it, it was a big issue and it looks bad on my part. But to me, you know, in hindsight, it was actually a really cool experience um, because I realized that as a co-op, as a student, I had major impact on the production floor. So I had to, uh, you know, whether it was good or bad, I was working on projects that related directly to the work environment and had an impact on the work environment, whether it was good or bad. Um, and then I had to think, react quickly and think fast on what am I going to do? You know, I didn't have, I didn't have time to wait until eight o'clock when my manager got in to say, Hey, what should I do about these parts that are my problem? I had to go in, take them off the line, um, work with, you know, the union stewards in the area to say, Hey, I'm going to be touching these parts, but if not, if I don't do this, you know, we're going to have more downtime. So I had to use my relationships that I had built and use my people skills to kind of tie all of it together and, and get the problem solved as quick as possible. So all that hopefully kind of leads into this, this last statement of, you know, there's more than one way to be an engineer. Um, you don't have to get your mechanical engineering degree and go directly into a design field and work for a mechanical engineering firm or go into consulting. Uh, there's, that's definitely out there if you want to do that. And I applaud all of you for doing that. You're probably 10 times smarter than me. Um, but for me, I went through a lot of my classes and realized, you know, thermodynamics and fluids and, and heat transfer maybe weren't my favorite classes. And what I enjoyed most about a lot of my classes were interacting with people and, and managing groups of people and leading. Um, so 
what I had to decide early on was, does that mean I need to switch majors or can I keep this engineering degree and still go and do what I wanted to do um, in a career? And I realized, you know, plenty of people hire mechanicals, plenty of people hire aerospace engineers, even if it's not for engineering. So just know that you don't have to do directly, you know, you don't have to go into a career that's directly tied to engineering to have an engineering degree. Um, just know that when you're getting your degree, make sure you're honing your problem solving skills, your people skills, and your critical thinking um, to be able to use in the workplace. So that is all I had uh, kind of for the main body of the, of the discussion. Now I'll kind of go into uh, GE appliances and a general overview and then work through some of uh, the different topics I, I brought up earlier. Um, but the biggest thing I wanted to highlight right now is, is you all probably know the GE appliances name, but you, a lot of you may not know that we are actually no longer a part of the GE corporation. So GE appliances was actually sold uh, from GE to a company called High Air, which is a Chinese appliance uh, company that's uh, a global company operated out of Qingdao, China. Um, so we are no longer a part of the GE brand, though we still have the logo and we still keep the branding. Um, we are now part of High Air. So GE Appliances itself uh, has around 12,500 employees in the United States, um, whereas High Air is a global company with about 77,000 total employees. Um, and they bring about a $37 billion a year revenue. Um, so it kind of gives you the scale that we're still a part of this very large organization, very large company. Um, but we are our own subset. Um, alongside GE Appliances, High Air owns, you know, their High Air brand, but they also own Fisher and Paykel and Candy. So we're this very large appliance corporation that's kind of sharing different ideas and, and trying to become the number one appliance uh, company in the United States. So to give you more overview of GE, you know, we build around 2,300 units per hour. We're, to give you kind of a scale of things, we're delivering an appliance every four and a half seconds to a home. Um, so we're, we're dealing with a lot of units, a lot of parts, a lot of dollars here, you know, thrown around to, to get people the appliances they need. Um, and something I think we're very proud on and we think is very important is, is trying to reduce our footprint. So uh, as much as we can, you know, we're trying to bring parts in reusable containers and, and not have, you know, plastic waste and cardboard waste. And though when we do have to, we make sure that we're recycling all of our wood and our cardboard that we use for parts. Um, over 30 million pounds of it uh, every year. And even for the parts that we build in house, so say for our refrigerators, we're making our own plastic liners. Usually those are about 50% uh, regrind or recycle material. And then the rest of the stats on here just kind of again shows you that the, the scale of GE appliances is still one of the largest companies in the United States um, for appliances specifically and then just in general. So there's a lot going on, there's a lot of problems to solve. Um, so it's a really good spot to work because you're, you're never really bored. There's always something to, to be working on. So our purpose um, is to enable happiness and well-being in every home. And we take that to heart. And usually we, we want to say that that starts with our employees. So if we're enabling happiness and well-being in our employees' lives, then we're transferring that over to our consumers. And we believe the consumer is boss. And we're always trying to anticipate their needs and bring new items to market that we feel are gonna you know, provide for our consumers in a way that they, they need or they haven't even seen yet. Um, but I wanna touch on kind of this last quote at the end there, it says, do what's right, it's your company. So as the employees, it's our company. Um, and we're actually, we're given a lot of freedom to do what we want within the company. And, but as long as we're making sure that we're doing what's right. So that means, you know, if I don't wanna go into work from eight to five, if I have a job you know, that allows me to go in nine to six or even nine to four and then work from eight o'clock PM to 10 PM if I wanted to, um, if your job grants you that freedom, we allow that to happen as long as we make sure everyone's still doing the right thing, doing their work, attending the meetings they need to attend to, um, and getting things done. And we find that creating this type of balance allows people to work around their lives a little bit better and, and have this better work-life balance. Because if you don't have, you know, a good balance of spending time at home with your family, doing the things you enjoy, this, the time that you're spending at work may not be as productive or you, you know, you may not stay with the company as long. So we really feel that employees are the most important part of the business and you know with happy employees that are that are enabled to do what they want to do they're going to produce more and, and be more efficient so that's very important for us as a company and I've, I've seen it firsthand as i've been there the next thing that's super important to us is kind of our community relations so we're, we're out of louisville kentucky is the major headquarters but we have plants in all other states and we have different warehouses in a lot of other states as well and um, wherever we're working, we're trying to make sure we're in touch with the community and in tune with the community, and whether that's through volunteering, through charitable contributions, you know, working with nonprofits. Um, we also do employee matching. So 
you know, if an employee wants to do a donation to a certain charity or a certain nonprofit, um, GE will match that. I believe it's a full one-to-one -one matching, um, but it's, it's really cool to see. I think I was raising money for Dance Marathon when I was at co-op and everyone that I asked also got their contributions matched. So it's kind of doubled the amount of money that I was able to fundraise, which was really awesome to see. And then on top of that, um, we do, we're very involved in volunteerism. So each year, um, aside from small volunteer projects that we do, you know, throughout the year, we do really lot, two really large volunteer projects, um, one in the spring and one in the fall, um, that where we take every GE appliance employee that's able to come out, um, you take the day off work and you go out to a certain area of the community and we try and kind of renovate any spot of the community that maybe, maybe has seen some harder times or maybe needs some, some updates. So whether that's going to, you know, one neighborhood and, and helping Habitat for Humanity build several homes, or if that's going to a community center and, and re completely renovating it, painting the community center and, and repaving the sidewalk and planting trees. Um, we give the opportunity for all the employees to go out and do that and, and help give back to the area in which they live. Um, since I've been there, I think I've been involved in three or four of the fall projects, fall and spring projects, and it's really cool to see everyone come together and kind of give back and take a day off work to, to give back to the community. Next, we'll talk about kind of our inclusion and diversity. I think this is a really important topic now, you know, obviously more so than ever, but um, it, it's not something that's new to GE. So ever since I've been here and years before I, I came to the company, they've had these, in, these uh, affinity networks and there's nine of them shown right there. Um, there's different groups, you know, alongside that as well, but we have different groups that allow people to kind of share their culture and, and experience different cultures as well. So none of these groups are uh, exclusive. So if you're not African American, you can still be a part of the African American Forum, the Hispanic Forum, or the Pride Group, whichever it may be. Um, I believe Bill Good, who's a, who's a male, is our Vice President of Supply Chain. He is one of the chairs on the Women's Network. So um, none of these groups are exclusive. We want everyone to be a part of and learn from as many of these groups as they can. Um, I think it's really important that if you come work for us or if you work for any company, that you try and find groups like this to be able to to work together and understand different cultures and different ideas. And we believe that that kind of helps us nurture talent and spark innovation in different ways. Um, if you're learning to think ways that other people think, you might be able to uh, in increase the way that you're producing and increase your efficiency and bring new ideas to the table, both inside the company and how we're interacting with the community. So from there, um, I want to talk a little bit about our, our COVID-19 response. So obviously this has affected you guys as students um, and affected just about every business in the United States. Uh, for us specifically, we have a lot of suppliers in China that, that were affected by it. And it hit us at a rough time because we normally have to deal with Chinese New Year, which comes around a little bit after the beginning of the year. Um, most Chinese suppliers will go on vacation or go on holiday for, for a month. And we have to deal with getting enough parts in beforehand from these suppliers to where we can last that month and then they can build our stock back up when they return to production. But at the end of Chinese New Year this year, coronavirus hit and we had a lot of suppliers that continued to stay home and not work production. So we started to eat into our safety stock and this really affected some of the lines and the models that we were running. So what we had to do uh, before coronavirus came to the United States is try and focus on what lines were we going to continue to run, what uh, were we going to prioritize in terms of what our consumers were demanding, um, and then once the once the COVID hit the United States, um, obviously we we stayed in accordance with any of our national and state statutes. Um, we actually were deemed an essential supplier, an essential business because more people are working from home now and people need appliances more than ever. They need you know chest freezers to store all the food that they want to save um, since people are using their appliances more they need to get service more so we knew we had to continue production and continue our service teams so to do so we halted our production for two weeks made sure that we were making the necessary changes to ensure the health and safety of the employees um, so that we could go back to production and keep up with our consumers demands but ensure that our, our employees were staying safe and healthy um, and since we did that, we have not had any, you know, over the 12,500 employees that we've had, we haven't had any diagnosed that I'm aware of any diagnosed cases of coronavirus and everyone has stayed as healthy as can be. So some of the precautions that we took um, were creating these temperature screening stations. So these are infrared cameras that, that can screen temperature and anyone that, you know, is above the, the fever limit of 100.4 is sent home um, to go into self-quarantine. 
or get tested. Um, and then if everyone tests good, you know, for their, for their temperature, we provide everyone with one mask per day. Um, there's hand sanitizer stations set up throughout. And then at the jobs that are able to, we provide um, social distancing requirements of so six feet apart for everybody, or we provide these plexiglass, screen, plexiglass screens that you can see to try and keep people separated. Um, anyone that's not working in the plant, we require them for, to work from home for a specific, uh, particular time. Now we are allowing people to, uh, to come into the office if they would like to every other week. But uh, for, for most of us, you know, we're still urged to work from home. So for myself, I've been working from home since the start of, uh, since the start of March, and I probably will be working from home the rest of the year. And it's really good that, you know, GE Appliances is allowing me to do that. I can go in and take my monitor home. I take my laptop home. I can do everything I need to do from home, you know, to make sure I'm keeping myself safe, keeping everyone else safe, keeping my family safe. Um, so it's really cool to see that, you know, we're still able to keep production up, but allow everyone that can to work from home and, and stay safe and keep their families safe. Um, how this would affect you as a co-op or an intern if you came into the company, I believe most co-ops, at least on the supply chain side, would be working in the plants. Um, again, but you'd be making, we'd be following social distancing. We'd have gloves and masks available for anyone that needs them um, and to make sure that we're aligned with state statutes. Um, so just know that, you know, if you came up there, you most likely would be in the plant with maybe an option to work from home on certain days, um, but you'd be fully, you know, provided for and cared for in terms of the proper protective equipment and, and social distancing needs that you would need to be meeting. So aside from that, you know, obviously, it's really good and all that we can stay in production um, and we can get all this equipment and, and PPE that we need, whether it's masks, gloves, sanitizer, face shields. Um, what we wanted to make sure is we were also helping provide for hospitals and schools that needed that needed the equipment as well. So us as a large corporation with a lot of connections to China, we were able to procure a whole lot of masks and gloves um, for people. But uh, we were seeing a big, big shortage uh, in our hospitals of this equipment. So in the different areas that we were located, we provided over 100,000 masks in Kentucky and Georgia and South Carolina and, and everywhere else that we're located, um, provided them to the local first responders and hospitals and schools to make sure that, you know, they were staying stocked with what they need. And then we also gave the contacts that we had for different local and, and overseas suppliers of masks and gloves to those different people so they could purchase them themselves if they wanted to. So it was really cool to see that we weren't just focused on keeping production up, but we were trying to give back to the community and, and help with, with anything that we can to, to keep the United States healthy and safe. So, so now to uh, what most of you guys are probably curious about um, is recruiting. So like I said, I'm one of the head recruiters for the supply chain team. Usually we have about five to seven of us come down for both supply chain and technology to recruit at every showcase. And this is kind of a list of what we're looking for. So all of you guys are looking for mechanical engineers to come on both supply chain and the technology teams. We're also looking for electrical engineers, industrial and systems engineering for supply chain, and then computer science for technology. Our requirements are just that you have a 3.0 GPA. Um, and then this graduation date, all that means is I want we want to see people that can come back for more than one rotation. So whether that's, you know, you come in the spring or the fall, and then you want to do one more summer or maybe another spring. Um, we want to see that you've done more than one rotation. That's not a requirement, but it helps us get a better understanding of how you're going to fit within the company and then how um, it gives you an understanding too of, you know, the different opportunities that we, we have to offer. So maybe you don't entirely enjoy your first role, but you see a spot that you want to work in, you know, the next time you come back, you can fully have the opportunity to do so and learn a little bit more about where you might fit best. So right now, you know, for Showcase, I believe we're going to be attending virtually. I'm not sure if we're going to be down in person yet. Um, this fall, but either way, we're going to be recruiting for spring 2021 and fall 2021 co-ops. Um, a question I get asked a lot is why don't we hire for summer? And that is because our summer spots get filled really quickly by our returning summer or spring and fall co-ops. So your first one will most likely be spring or fall with a, an option to return in the summer if you would like. So as I said before, we're, we're located in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we do have other plants in other parts of the states, but 99% of the the, the co-ops from UF will be going up to Louisville. Um, we have a very large industrial park there. It's over 750 acres. It's about a mile long. Um, to give you an idea of scale, it's got its own zip code. So it's a really big area. Um, there's more than 6,000 employees in that one specific location with you know close to 1,000 of them being engineers. Um, it's a, Louisville's a really cool city. Uh, it's It's got a whole lot of food. It's got a whole lot of 
things to do. I mean, it, it kind of gives you this big city feel without being, you know, a big city where you're stuck in New York traffic or Atlanta traffic. Um, I've lived in Gainesville and, and Tallahassee my whole life. So I'm used to kind of the small college town. And it was really nice to kind of get up to a bigger city where I've been here for maybe two years and still haven't done everything there is to do. Um, and I'm finding new things and more cool things to, to be involved in and be a part of. So it's, it's a really cool city to be in. It's a young city. Um, there's a lot of young working professionals in the area. So, you know, if you get the opportunity to come up, I, I think it's definitely cool. It's not can, you know, people think of Kentucky and they might have some predilections of, of going up to Kentucky, but um, we're right on the river uh, and it's, it's a really cool thriving city to be a part of. So if you come up for a co-op or internship, um, <clears throat> you'd be joining a group of, you know, upwards of 125, 130 different co-ops that are uh, involved in supply chain, technology, IT, sales, um, you know, and we really finance through some finance supply co-ops as well. Um, you will all kind of get in touch with each other and, and you'll have contacts with each other. And a lot of you might be living together um, when you go up there. Uh, and it's a really cool environment to be in. You're not just going to a company where you're only going to be in touch with your one team where you have, you know, five people on your team that are 20 years older than you and those are your only contacts. And we get you in touch with your peers, with people that are doing similar things than you uh, and different things uh, than you so you can share your experiences and, and learn from each other and understand different roles that are out there and available. Um, we throw you kind of right into the fire. There's there's some training period, but it's not a whole lot. You're not spending three weeks training. You get maybe a couple of days of orientation and then you're out there solving problems and, and working on things that we need you to work on for the business. So you obviously have a direct manager that you report to that can help answer any questions you need, but you know, everyone in the company is there to help. So if you go out and you're you're looking for questions or looking for problems to solve, you know, you have the opportunity to, and everyone's more than happy to help the co-ops. Um, you just have to, you know, not be afraid to look or ask questions. Um, another thing, you know, we get a lot of questions on, is it a paid internship, what, what's provided? So yes, it's a, it's a paid internship, it's very competitive. Uh, and then you also, especially coming from Florida, you'll receive relocation benefits, you know, to make the trip up and you receive housing benefits as well, whether that's in terms of free housing or a stipend to, to find your own housing. So they definitely take care of you as a co-op. I mean, the picture right here is that's actually Chase Amirati. He's a past UF co-op. I think he did two or three rotations with us and he'll be graduating soon. So, um, you know, he had, he had a really good experience up there and I believe he's applying for the supply chain development program as well. So that's kind of what I'll go into next is <clears throat> post-graduation, um, we use our co-op pipeline as a, our co-op, you know, group as a pipeline into our development programs. And that's kind of our direct, you know, full-time hire positions. Um, we have a lot of co-ops and interns that come to, and then there's a very select group that get picked to go into your development programs. And we have them both in engineering and technology and then in the supply chain. So for technology, it's called the Edison Engineering Development Program. And that's a three-year program where you, in the course of the program, you get your master's degree in either electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, or computer science, I believe. Um, it's all paid for by GE Appliances through the University of Louisville. You get, you're allowed, you know, you're granted the time to take off work to go to your classes. And, and I think a lot of them are actually offered on GE Appliances campus. Um, <clears throat> so that's, again, more for your design students, your technology students that really want to be involved in CAD work and in design work and focus really on the technical details that you got from schooling. And then on the other side of that is what I was involved in. This is what I went through, um, the supply chain development program. So it's a two-year program, you know, of four different rotations. Every six months, you're going into something new. So that was how I was able to get experience in sourcing, uh, lean, supplier quality, and material planning. And the really good part about both of these programs is you're doing these different rotations so that you understand a little bit more about the different parts of the business that you could work in and understand where you might fit in best. So a lot of issues people see is, you know, you come off graduation, you go into a job, you work for two years before you realize you don't really want to be doing that line of work. Now here you get the opportunity to work for two years on four different, four to five different types, different lines of work and understand where you might fit best in and what interests you most. Um, <clears throat> And then from there, once you graduate from program, you're, you're able to kind of pick the area that you feel you're going to fit in best and then look for teams that work in that function that, um, <clears throat> sorry, that have openings that you can apply for. So the picture here is actually of Omar Shatar. He's a UF grad as well, one of the other recruiters that we go down with to recruit for supply chain. Um, but he was saying, you know, it's cool to see things you work in every day in your home or store. So that, that is something that's different, right? Maybe you go work for one of these big aerospace companies, you 
you're not going to see a whole lot of air airplane engines and turbines around, but you go into Home Depot and you see a, a GE appliance, you go into Lowe's and see a GE appliance. It's, it's kind of cool to see something you might've touched you might've worked on, you know, in the store and you can show it to a bunch of people and show the different things that you've been working on, which is awesome. So that was kind of all I had. Um, this is kind of some future events we have going on. Obviously you can continue to rewatch this video, share it with as many people as possible. Um, but this July 30th, we're going to be doing a virtual info session and a, a tour of First Build, which is our small scale um, manufacturing facility that we're partnered with the University of Louisville. Uh, it's a very small um, prototyping lab that we have, you know, 3D scanners, we have laser jets, we have CNC machines, 3D printers. Um, anyone can go in and do prototyping themselves, you know, it, for free. It's it's open to the public and open to students. So it's a, it's a very cool spot to be. Um, and that's going to, we're going to be holding an info session and tour that on July 30th with Theta Tau. So you don't have to be in Theta Tau uh, to join, but hopefully I'll get an email sent out to everybody through the College of Engineering um, for that with a link soon. After that, this kind of shows you some other things we're trying to do, other virtual tours and other roundtables. Um, but as we get more dates on there, we will try and, uh, I'll try and send emails out. So I think that's all I had. Noel, I think uh, we're open up for questions, correct? Yep. Uh you're hundred percent correct. So yeah, I really, really appreciate that in the um, presentation. Uh, so we actually have a couple of questions queued up uh, from the audience. And uh, while, I'm, while we're talking about the first question, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and you can post it through YouTube right now. And uh, we'll, we'll say it out loud as they come through. So the first one is from Professor Stephen Mil uh, Miller. Thanks for your presentation. Can you please give an example of conflict resolution within your teamwork at UF and how those examples translate to an example at GE and how was it resolved? Sure, yeah, so um, I'm sure a lot of you are, are in mom lab or have taken mom lab or DML. Um, when I was in DML, we, uh, I think you you get, you're know, part in a group of, of four or five students um, to work on, you know, your robotics project. And obviously everyone comes up with their own design first, and then you have to bring all those designs together and figure out what's the best one, right? To, to move forward with and then build that. Um, so there can easily be a whole lot of conflict there. Um, and specifically with my group, you know, I, I had actually broken my thumb the Christmas before I started DML. So I couldn't write anything. So I couldn't draw, do my 3D drawing um, on, on paper before, uh, before doing my CAD model. So I didn't really have anything to present. Um, but I still obviously had ideas and things that I wanted to, to showcase to the group on what I thought was a good idea for what we should build. Um, and one of my group members, you know, didn't really see eye to eye with me and he had his own ideas on, on what he thought the, the robot should look like. So there was definitely some, some butting of heads and, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit, I'm, I'm definitely not, uh, I, I definitely like to think that my idea is always one of the better ideas. Um, I'm a little stubborn, but it, it takes some time to learn and understand other people's side of things. And I think as you go through more of your classes, you're going to understand that that's more important than proving that you're right is to try and understand both sides and then decide whether you're right or the other person's right. Um, so what ended up happening for, for ours is uh, we kind of wrote down sort of a pros and cons list. It was a little more detail. We kind of created a matrix of different aspects of each of our designs, um, including the other two group members of what we thought was better for each goal that we needed to meet for the project, right? I think we were trying to bring tennis balls off of a tree and drop them into a hopper on our uh, on our unit, on our robot, and then bring them to different buckets uh, on the playing field. So we picked all those different goals, then grabbed the different uh, parts of each of our designs that were designed to meet those goals, um, and then kind of ranked them on how well we thought it would perform, and then ranked everyone else's as well. And then from there, we kind of decided, okay, we picked and choose from each people's design. I think we got a mix of at least one item from everybody's design that we ended up using um, in the final product and making, we had to make sure obviously that it all matched up and it made sense um, for the design specs. But really, I think the important part of it is learning that while yes, your answer might be the best answer and, and you can see that from the start, it's sometimes it is that obvious. You need to understand how to see other people's side of things and maybe understand why they're seeing it that way. And then if you understand the why behind it, you can understand you know, maybe how to talk to them and show them that maybe your answer is the right way. Or you go ended up and looking through, when you look through that lens, you understand, well, crap, maybe my, my answer isn't the best answer. Um, so a little bit of humility uh, goes a long way and a little bit of 
looking on the other side of things um, definitely helps. I totally, totally agree. The, the second question came in from Justin. So what would be the benefits or the downsides coming in as a co-op during the COVID pandemic in terms of overall experience? And will co-ops going in during the, the pandemic get the same amount or the same level of work experience as before? Yeah, um, very good question. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I, there's there's going to be a difference now from people coming in after the pandemic kind of has already been settled a little bit and we kind of gotten to the routine of things. Um, if you were a co-op right at the start, you know, when we started working from home, a lot of our co-ops got sent home, whether that was with laptops or they had their internships cut short, um, you know, if we didn't have a need for, for that part of the business anymore. Uh, there's definitely a difference. I would say right now going in, you know, in pandemic when we're still in quarantine, especially Kentucky's been a little bit stricter than Florida in terms of what we're opening and what we're allowing. Um, you are you are definitely going to be given work, so I wouldn't say you're going to get less work. If anything, you're going to get more work because we have we're always trying to figure out how we can perform better during coronavirus or during COVID. Um, so as you go in, you know you you will you'll be given a whole lot of work that's going to directly impact the business. Um, and I think honestly, it's a benefit to see you know how a company is reacting to this type of environment. It's going to be different than than any other internship or co-op you've had before. You know, with any company that you go in currently during this time period, you're going to see how a company is acting during crisis and how they're managing um, their different priorities. Right? Are they focusing more on their employees? Are they focusing more on their consumers? Are they focusing on um, how to make their plants safer, how to make you know the, the products that they send out um, cheaper, or do they have to raise prices because of you know the different things that are going on? So it's it's I think it's a really cool environment to be in right now, um, aside from obviously the the health implications. But manufacturing is being done a whole lot differently right now, and it's if you can get in, into any sort of manufacturing right now, um, you're going to be seeing a, a different experience, and you might be seeing the way of the future. Right? I think we're we might be learning new ways we can do things that we might not have thought of if this pandemic didn't hit. So, um, yeah, I mean, you definitely have to look at it from the bright side of things, but, um, in terms of, you know, will you get the same amount of experience or, or more, you definitely be getting the same, if not more amount of work to do. Cause the reason we're hiring people is because we need spots filled. So, yeah. yeah and, um, so actually I'll ask my own question before I go to the next one. So, uh, so it's a lot of the development and stuff you guys are doing on your line, uh, more towards like lights out production where you would have a robot arm that would like help do you know, the assembly of this one subsection and you can show it 24 seven, you know, nobody's going to get sick, you know, from, cause robots can't really get sick. Maybe they can get viruses, but. Yeah. So no, a good question. And this is something that before the pandemic we've been working on for a while now. Um, if you think about it, yes, from the health implications, it's very helpful, but also from a, from a dollar standpoint, right? If you can remove, you know, a person from from a spot on the line. That's one less, you know, dollar amount that you have to pay to do that. It's a lot cheaper to, to run a robot or to run a mechanical operation than it is to pay for a person and health benefits and whatnot. So it is something that everyone's always looking at in terms of going towards automation. Um, at GE Appliances, we've already started that. You know, before this whole pandemic, we we've been running a couple projects to get AGVs or autonomously guided vehicles in our plants. So right now, in I want to say three three to five of our plants, we have AGVs running around bringing parts to our to our uh, operating line. So they can, they'll be loaded on, on a truck from a supplier brought to our plant, loaded off the truck into a certain warehousing, you know, area of the plant. An operator will take it from there. And normally how we did it before is an operator would put it on their own tugger, their own cart, bring it to the line, wait for it to be unloaded. Uh, and then that operator would just be sitting there, right? For 15, 20 minutes doing nothing, waiting for it to be unloaded as the line went through. Then they'd go back, the next operator would fill in their spot with the next set of parts. Um, and it kind of starts this process. And we realize, you know, it's a lot of wasted time for this person to be sitting there that we're paying for. So we brought in some AGVs to do that one job. So we have a, an autonomously guided vehicle that gets loaded up at the, at the warehousing spot in the plant. It drives, you know, completely on its own, you know, through through the plant where there's a lot of foot traffic or there's other tuggers driving around. It creates its path. It stops at the section of the line um, and an, until an operator then clicks that it's good and all that has been removed. And then it makes its way back to uh, to the warehousing facility. So that's just kind of one of the sections. And then obviously there's a whole lot of robotics that goes into appliance making. You know, we can't be picking up fridges and and moving them across yeah. the floor. And so, um, just in in terms of general manufacturing, there's an insane amount of robotics going 
And then we have what we call AME teams, so advanced manufacturing engineer teams that technically are a part of the supply chain um, that work on all those machines every single day. So that's that's another cool spot to be in. But yeah, it's robots are everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Because like at face value, from the outside looking in, uh, the volatility the volatility with COVID um, and being an engineering person uh, basically it allows you to like use more technology at a faster rate than you would otherwise not get that not get access to. So I think the work experience would be like actually better for engineering students uh, during COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the uh, so next question is actually from uh, from handle uh, some dude forty four. Uh, so does GE offer the opportunity for people to jump from supply chain to the technology program, from the supply chain program to the technology mm -hmm. program? Yeah, that is a very frequent question we get. Um, the answer to that has changed. It used to be we didn't like it as much, and as a lot of us kind of younger people kind of came up, we were, we kept asking the question why, you know why would we not want to keep someone in the company that we like if they want to switch, you know, to the other, to the other side of things. Um, so the, the answer is yes, we definitely are offered the opportunity. Um, the question is, is that the right experience for you? Right? So if you, if you go in and you have one experience, one co-op as a supply chain co-op, and then you have your next experience as a technology co-op, you're only getting one in each function. Um, so then if you try and go back and apply for a full-time position, one of these development programs, you're only going to have one experience to draw from that ties in directly to that program. So you have to make sure that that's the decision you want to make. If you want to experience both, we definitely allow it and we have the opportunities to, to do so. We, we, you know, both our supply chain and technology HR teams are in touch with each other. And if you really want to, um, to make that change, we can, I think actually there's a couple of UF co-ops that have done it, um, that I've recruited and I've kind of helped through that process. Uh, but you just have to know that it might come back to bite you if you don't get enough experience in one spot, it might hurt you in the long run. Um, but again, it's it, you make of it what you can. So if, if you don't know yet, then it's definitely a good experience to try both. Um, but I, what I try and recommend is I'll give you as much information as I can about supply chain compared to technology. And then you tell me as a student, what you're more interested in and then i'll try and decide do i think technology or supply chain is better once you get there if you want to switch we definitely have the opportunity to um it just you know it's up to you and do you think it's going to be the best fit for you another question came in from uh, i'm going to mispronounce this yeah yeah does ge uh, inter, um does ge hire international students yeah good question and um unfortunately for co-op positions we do not uh that's a question we get a lot so we do not hire anyone that will currently require sponsorship or in the future will require sponsorship to work in the United States. Um, I know it's unfortunate. I know there's a lot of you that might be grad students or international students right now. And I wanna thank you for taking, you know, for coming to UF. I think it's a great opportunity, but um, right now GE Appliances is not hiring any international students, but that's primarily for our co-op positions. So if you are looking for a full-time position, um, if you go to, I think it was on the page, uh, uh, careers.geappliances.com positions on there that I believe we do take some sponsorship for. Um, I'm not 100% positive on that, of what's available currently, since I'm more tied to the co-op programs. But I know there's also, since obviously we're not owned by a Chinese corporation, we we have the need for people that are fluent in Mandarin um, that, that can either go back into China frequently or live in China and go back there to work. So there are opportunities, but unfortunately for co-op positions, we, we do not hire international students. And a follow-up question to that is, uh, so I know the, the main headquarters is in Louisville, but do you guys have like a remote locations in, let's just say, Brazil or, or, or China or Norway or, or wherever for international students? Yeah, so for GE appliances specifically, nothing out of the states. It's um, We have plants in Louisville, Kentucky, Camden, South Carolina, Lafayette, Georgia, uh, Decatur, Alabama, and Selmer, Tennessee. So those are our in-state plants. We also have some... Uh, some plants and some finance organizations down in Puerto Rico, but co-ops and students normally, there's no opportunity really to go down there. Now, High Air, they have plants all over the world, um, mainly in China and mainland China. Um, but then we have sister companies, you know, Fisher Paykel and, and High Air that, or Fisher and Paykel and Candy that work out of Europe and the Australia, New Zealand area. So the answer is yes, there are other places to work. Um, and it's not unheard of to maybe go and, and operate there, but you'd be switching from business to business um, and that's not super common. So for GE appliances, it's all in the States, but as an international student, um, 
particularly if you're a Mandarin um, speaking student, there are opportunities in China. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, you know, through my email, definitely do so. And I can try and forward you to the right contacts. Um, I just don't know them off the top of my head. And we have another question from Anthony. Uh, what opportunities does GE have for graduate students in MAE in the areas of manufacturing technology and re renewable energy? So for renewable energy, I don't think there's uh, that many. It's obviously, it's an appliance company. So um, there's not a whole lot that we're doing in that space. But in terms of graduate students for MAE, we do take exceptional graduate students for co-ops, but you have to want to do a co-op and then go into the one of the graduate programs. This will more likely be in the case of supply chain. Um, I don't believe the technology side takes graduate students because you get your, your master's degree when you go through the Edison program. So um, I do know there are some uh, grad students or post-grad students that are on the supply chain development program that already have their master's in a certain field um, or were co-ops during their, their master's program. So yes, it is possible. Um, but again, you'll have to highlight that to the recruiter or to myself that you're a grad student um, and you'll have to kind of follow the same regulations of meeting the certain degree requirements of a 3.0 and um, having a certain amount of time left before you graduate. Uh, yeah, so I think we're getting a little bit of interruption on the on the broadcast. Um, so let's see if Daniel can chime back in in a couple of seconds. Yeah, so I think it's computer might have had a failure. Um, yeah, so what we'll do is um, the we'll just talk about uh, yeah. So what yeah, basically what Daniel was saying at base value was I think the GE appliance program, and we'll confirm this with Daniel when he comes back on. It's mostly geared for for, for bachelor degree students, and then once you actually join the company, they'll pay for your master's degree, and then um, from there, I guess GE will take care of you. So. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And then, let's see. Yeah, the all question. The out. So, you know, one thing I, when I was like viewing uh, Daniel's uh, presentation is, yeah, how nonlinear engineering is. So, the background that I have is like pretty, like pretty technical. And from, from my, like, if you just ask me at face value, like, hey, Noel, when you graduated, what are you going to do? It's like, oh, design airplanes or make cars and, and stuff like that. So yeah, like the, the entire side of supply chain is a uh, is a field that I didn't actually know that like really existed except I should just you know just give somebody money and they would parts would show up and it's actually unfortunately not that simple. Um, and if you guys are interested in, in supply chain, there's actually a, a huge uh, field of research called uh, OR. It's called operations research, and it's actually uh, it's actually a part of industrial engineering. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but uh, it's a part of industrial engineering and. Uh, operations research is kind of the art and science of supply chain, and the the best way I can describe how that kind of works is like when UPS takes a package from you, and they come in, and for five dollars they can get it to California in six days. Um, how can they make that system work analytically? So if you're kind of curious on that, go ahead and, and Google it. So it looks like Daniel actually got back in. Sweet. Um, so yeah, I kind of forgot where we left off. So, oh, with the, the graduate students in MAE. So I, I was actually telling the audience, so like in kind of a high level summary is like GE appliances is mostly geared towards, actually, Daniel, can you, can you hear me? I just want to do a mic check. I can, yes, no, I'm Perfect. back, yeah, sorry. Awesome, yeah, so um, so just as a high level overview, GE is mostly geared for, for, I guess, undergrad students that are you know doing an engineering path. And if they, want to do a master's, it's mostly geared like, hey, you come to the company and then we'll put you under a wing and you guys will, you'll do a master's under us. Yeah, so that is the that is the typical path. Yeah, I would say. And that's the path I would recommend because <laughs> GE will pay for it. Um, so myself, I'm not paying anything for my for my MBA. Um, but if you know you really want to continue your education at UF and um, get your degree through UF, if you want to do it online, again, GE will pay for it while you're with the company and you take your own personal time to do the classes. Um, as long as you're completing your work, no one's gonna give you a hard time for it. If you want to complete your, your graduate degree before going to work for the company or do it while doing co-ops and internships, we can. it's definitely possible, it's doable, it's not the standard path, but um, you just have to work with the recruiters and work with the HR folks to, to talk about, you know, is that the way you wanna go? And then how is that gonna benefit the company? 
And then we actually have uh, one question from the, from the legend, Dr. Banks. So to what extent is machine learning or artificial intelligence being used in supply chain and technology? And is that a skill set that you guys are actively looking for? Yeah, it looks like, uh, it looks like Daniel's mic's cutting, cutting out. Um, so I'll give him about a good 10 seconds to see if he can get, if he can reconnect. Oh, actually, Daniel, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Did you miss the Perfect. whole thing I just said? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> okay. yeah, do you mind repeating everything you just said? Yeah, yeah that's fine. I, I don't know what's going on with my internet. Usually, I thought it was going to be my computer crashing, but it's not that. It's just internet cutting out. Um, but yeah, so we, we do, you know, normally I would suggest you getting your your degree after you start with the, the company because it'll be completely paid for, right? It's I'm getting my MBA absolutely free right now. I'm not paying anything, um, but it is possible to get your master's degree beforehand. We just have to make sure it's going to, you know, tie in with the career, the path that you'd be taking with GE, right? So, you know, if it's in a specific uh, degree that might not exactly apply to supply chain or might not technology, if that's fit. Um, but it's, again, always talking with the recruiters, talking with the HR team about what might be best for both the company and yourself. Um, we want you to do what's best for you, uh, just making sure it aligns with the career path at GE Appliances. Awesome. And then we have okay, actually two more questions and then yeah. we'll wrap up because uh, I think we're pushing over time a little bit. So yeah, Dr. Banks said, um, to what extent is machine learning and AI being used for supply chain and technology? And is that a skill set that you guys are actively looking for? Yeah, so that's that's mainly run by our IT department. Um, in terms of supply chain specifically, no, it's not anything that at least us as a recruiting team is looking for currently. Um, what I will say is if you come with that experience to G appliances as a supply chain, uh, as a supply chain co-op or supply chain employee, we are 100% more than happy to listen to these new experiences and new ideas. That's part of the reason we recruit from a lot of these different colleges and UF specifically is because we're bringing new ideas, even as co-ops that people are going to listen to and are going to apply. Um, so from what I know in terms of my chain, I don't know a whole lot of AI or machine learning being used. Um, our, tech, our IT or focus more on that type of work. But um, again, if, if you have the experience, we're not going to turn it away. And if you have ideas, we're going to use them. So. Awesome. And then, yeah, it was cutting, cutting a little bit in and out um, as you were talking. So I'm just going to like, do a 10 second recap on it. So basically, yeah. like, um, uh, machine learning and AI at GE is mostly used in the technology group or the IT group. Um, yeah, and IT. then right now in supply chain, um, you guys don't have like, any super exact use cases. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I wouldn't say direct use cases right now, but again, if you come up with a problem solving idea that uses machine learning or AI and can showcase how it can be implemented in the business, people will listen. So, Perfect. Even, awesome. Oh. awesome. And then uh, one last question from uh, Professor uh, Matthew Tron. So how does the MAE capstone design class prepare students for success in the first jobs at a company like GE? Yeah. Um, and if my understanding is that in these capstone design, I took IPPD, so I, I was directly working with the company. I didn't do kind of the senior design process. Um, is my understanding that these capstone design classes, do you work with the company? Uh, no. So basically, it's, a, it's independently sourced, uh, usually through research labs. Um, so okay. research lab says we need a device, and they, they make it towards that. Right. And they are, they are team, uh, team build, correct? Yeah, so that's that's going to be the primary the primary function that you're going to use or primary skill you're going to gain from it is working on this design team. Um, if you're going to tie it directly to supply chain, um, it's just getting these people skills and working with a team of people that have different ideas. And obviously, one group, one person in the group might emerge as the leader, and other people might emerge as different sector leaders or in charge of different parts of it. Um, really, what it's going to be involved, or it's going to be the experience you're going to gain from it, is working on a cross-functional team of people that are skilled in different positions. Um, so, if you can learn what everyone's skill set is and how to optimize what they're good at to make the project go faster and be more efficient, that's what you're going to use for supply chain. Now, obviously, for technology, you're going to you're working directly on a design project. That's hand in hand what you'd be doing on on the design and technology team at GE. So, you know, there's they're going to be given a project or a problem to solve and you have to think through it critically and, and do your design thinking and work through a project and your experimental steps um, on a team again of cross-functional engineers that are all trying to accomplish the same goal with different ideas. Um, it's, it, it'll tie hand in hand with what you're doing in your design classes. Awesome. Thanks so much. 
Um, yeah, so we're pushing over uh, over time, so we're going to have to wrap up, unfortunately. So I want to uh, thank you, Daniel, so much for, for spending your time with us today. And uh, so if you guys have uh, any questions and stuff, you guys can reach out to Daniel directly. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll be launching another episode of the MA Speaker Series next week, so just be, be on the lookout for that. So I hope everybody has a good weekend and uh, a great day. So. Thank you. No problem.